Good morning, campers. Welcome to Radio Camp Apple, a Percy Jackson Real Long Podcast. I am your host, Zach. And I'm B. And this week, we read Chapter 14 of The Battle of the Labyrinth. My brother duels me to the death. And man, oh man, is there a duel? And I think someone dies? Maybe, who knows? <laughs> I mean, they read the chapter if they're listening to this. Or they didn't and they don't care. Either way, we're going to find out. Yeah, so B, what did you think of this chapter? Because I got plenty of thoughts. Yeah, are your thoughts that it's boring? Because I think you kind of played your hand before we started recording, where you were like, I forgot what happened in this chapter. It was pretty boring. Yes, it was very boring compared to last chapter, because I think so much happened. This was like, oh, oh, we, we need to already have danger and action, a lot of action. And like, nothing gets done. Yeah, again, we've talked a million times about how we're not like that thrilled about action. I actually... I have to say, the description of the action in this, I found easier to follow than some fight scenes. Like, I think the the specificity of, like, what's going on and, like, the descriptor of the physical setting was enough for me to sort of imagine what was happening. Now that I really think about it, I do believe I was imagining the Pokemon fighting ring from De- Detective Pikachu. Really? That's what you thought about? <laughs> yeah, I think I was just subconsciously, and now it is occurring to me that that's, that's sort of what I was imagining. Peek a peek. Um, uh, for me, I think I was having my like a dementia episode because I was thinking about the Rancor pit in Return of the Jedi, because it's just a big old pit, and then there's monsters and stuff in it. Though, once we get to the actual like illegal street fights... I think it becomes kind of interesting, but for the most part, this chapter is pretty much, if I wanted to sum it up, oh no, Percy in the game gets captured. Oh no, Luke is a jerk face. Oh no, Percy Jackson fights something and wins. Oh no, they run away. The end. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of it. There really isn't a lot. There isn't any dream sequence stuff. There isn't, I guess that makes sense because we do actually physically see Luke. So it's sort of, I guess we finally see the fruition of all of these sort of not even flashbacks i guess just these visions that percy has now we actually physically see um what's going on with luke and his i guess toadies i don't know what to call them his army it not his exactly groupies. his groupies yeah whatever his like weird monsters that are pals with him uh they show up and i guess that that's sort of interesting it's kind of not in a weird way it's like less compelling when they're physically just standing there than when it's percy kind of having visions B, it's more like it's a big old monster mash. It's like a graveyard smash type of situation. Like, it's cool. Like, if you think of it in, like, a visual setting, if you want it to be live action or animated, this is probably, like, the cantina scene in Star Wars where you just see a bunch of mythical creatures and there's, like, illegal street fights. But here's the thing, though, with this chapter is that it doesn't quite work because the way it's written, it's, like, not that impressive if you think about it because, you know, yes, they're in the circle and there's some cool stuff, but for the most part... Percy Jackson does nothing but win his sword fights, and there's no danger whatsoever because you know he's going to win. It's like this, B. It's like I, I always bring this up a lot. It's like when Indiana Jones shoots the guy with the sword. It's funny because it like, gets to the it, point, but here it's a, Yeah, it, he hacks it. And we know Percy Jackson is going to survive because there's still a big chunk of this book left. And- yeah, they're like, what are the stakes exactly? I guess the stakes would be what? Annabeth dying, maybe, or maybe Rachel dying? It's not suspenseful. That's kind of the hard part about this is that you know what's going to happen. Yeah, I, d- I don't get the sense of suspense. I, I know what you're saying. Um, I guess, like, there is the way that they threaten Rachel, but I kind of find it weird that they don't kill her, right? Like, she's pretty easy to kill. She's immortal. They even say that, like, oh, she's fragile. And then nothing. You know, they kind of just keep her hostage the whole time while Percy has to... Well, I mean, why don't we just describe how we got here? Because I feel like we're getting out of ourselves a little bit. This was kind of a frustrating chapter because it starts off almost too easy. Like, Rachel leads them to the little symbol that she was talking about in the basement. They, I've been trying to open it for months. And Annabeth's like, step aside, small child. I'll I'll give her the old... (laughs) She's like the same age, isn't she? Yes, but Annabeth is like doing like some BDE right now. It's like, I can do this. Yeah, she totally is kind of trying to assert her dominance a little bit. 
um with Percy there. She like puffs up her chest a little bit and like takes the latch and like opens up like super easy because it takes a half blood touch really it's it's really demigod work it's not man's work it's demigod work but then that makes less sense because they've talked about how people just magically just stumble into the labyrinth and just die yeah that doesn't make sense because then yeah they would have to be a demigod hold on whoa plot hole i didn't even think of that you're right it would have to be open already somehow well unless it's like you remember that milkman well secretly he's like a a son or daughter of somebody yeah, what is the Lord of Cows? Anyway, we're getting sidetracked. What I meant to say was that we did criticize Annabeth a lot in the beginning of this book for, like, weird, heavy-handed, like, jealousy things going on between her and Percy. And now it kind of makes sense because it feels like they were trying to set up some foreshadowing with how she would then act around Rachel now. And now it makes sense because you could actually see that Percy kind of has a thing for Rachel like the way he describes her even in like his narration he talks about how there's still some traces of gold in her hair and on her face and like that you know it's it's him paying very close attention to the way she physically looks and talking positively about her she definitely seems like maybe not a love interest for him but he has a crush or something the jealousy with Annabeth makes more sense and that's what makes this more of like a fun characterization because now she's not being like weird random jealous person out of nowhere she's just she's being hateful she's being a bratty yeah exactly like this this bratty hero who's like trying to like assert her dominance well she's also really petty here's the thing though is that with with annabeth i know people i already know the emails that we're gonna get but we've seen this before when she describes her parents and then percy jackson meets her parents and they're like nothing of the same and it's like okay true some people are different in other situations but Once again, this is Annabeth overreacting to a very petty thing, though. When when it comes to, like, boys and stuff, it's like when there's, like, multiple girls, it's just like, oh, my God, girls, Rachel, I might have a crush on you, but I also have a crush on Annabeth. She looked at me. No, she was scanning the horizon, but she looked at me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely I get that vibe from Percy. It's not even like he necessarily, like, loves... Rachel it's, it's just because he's he in likes the proximity attention. of a girl yeah I think that's definitely what it is which is kind of funny because then we also think back to um what's her face from the island now I can't remember her name already Calypso Calypso this dude man his hormones are raging just any girl who pays attention to him for like a week and he's like I have found the love of my life week more like when they look in my general direction yeah cool your jets my dude like I I kind of feel like on the, on the one hand, sometimes Annabeth overreacts. On the other hand, Percy's kind of a jerk, and he, you know, just kind of ignores Annabeth sometimes, or, like, seems like he's giving too much attention to other girls. I don't know. How canon is it that they are actually attracted to each other? Like, they they don't really talk about it, but they do kiss. Like, there has been established romantic relationship with them and then he's just sort of like well whatever there's another girl and she's paying attention to me thinking of it now uh it's that really makes sense because here's the thing last book we had thalia and percy and annabeth was completely a-okay and she's like oh this is this is great you know there are two people that like hate each other but maybe they might like each other They're spending a lot of time together talking about random things yeah do you think that has to do with annabeth already knowing Talia like from back in the day and so I don't know maybe it's different maybe it's different but also like Percy Jackson no matter what he does girls just like him it's like as if like he's written that way he just like stumbles into success he's always like oh like I'm just like a mess and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm barely solving all of the riddles around me and yet all of these girls are just like "Ooh, Percy you're so charming with your stupid stupid brain (laughs) like even annabeth calls him seaweed brain like he's not exactly known for being clever sometimes well he does one thing that's clever in this chapter and we'll get to we'll get to something clever unless he's like in a fight scene then all of a sudden it just jumps out his weird battle cleverness though gotta be fair he did get a cliff's notes kind of situation from annabeth she did give him a hint well yes but um even when it comes to percy i think the problem with him is that He's like he is charismatic, but he's not charming. I don't understand like girls like like woo over him. It's like for me as like a teenager, I was like I could 
barely get a date. I could, I had like one date in all of high school, and I like effed it up royally. But like Percy Jackson could do say all the wrong things. Zach Sokol less charming than Percy Jackson. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, I am. I mean, you don't have like magical powers, so I feel like he has a lot of that going for him. Hey, babe, I can make this water fountain shoot water. Yeah, I can make a rainbow. Ooh. Oh no, all these leprechauns are here now. Oh, great. (laughs) (laughs) That's a whole other problem. It's hard because also you have like the effect of like with Rick Riordan writing Percy in this way of just having girls like wooing onto him. It's just like it almost becomes like a hero cliche where it becomes like either like a harem or like a love triangle. Things that add spice up romance or spice up tension is something that happens a lot in fantasy books where we have even in anime, I'll give it a better a better example. Of this is anime where you always have like three or four girls, and the guy will always end up falling in love with the really boring one, when the other ones are like much more interesting. Yeah, I I get that. I mean, I just wanted to generally talk about the Annabeth characterization because I do think, in contrast to like the way that Percy acts, it makes sense actually for her to be a little bit jealous because he's kind of a doof and he doesn't really pay attention to like how his actions might affect i don't know the feelings of the girl that he's shown interest in you know like he's he doesn't really think about that i guess because he's also like a dumb teenage guy and like that's kind of what dumb teenage guys tend to do well yeah they think with their swords not their brains yeah exactly uh but even here i think it does add some type of like tension between the group because you have annabeth who's kind of off kilter right now you have rachel who's just like i'm here to go with the flow i hope i don't get traumatized yeah she's also interesting because at first she seems pretty blase about the whole thing like even percy mentions that oh she she kind of comes across as weirdly calm but like maybe she's hiding it but there are moments where they just like say something like oh yeah, my brother, he's a Cyclops. And she's like, oh right, your half-brother, the Cyclops. It's like, oh yeah, we need to find Grover, he's a satyr. Oh, of course, a satyr. Like, she's sort of really thrust into this world. Not unlike Percy in the first book, where she's like, oh, I guess I have to, like, adjust to the fact that this stuff is real. Because, I mean, I guess she knew that it was real, because that's the whole point, is she's a mortal who can see through the mist. But before it wasn't really confirmed, the way that it is now. You would think she'd be like super unfazed when she saw a bunch of skeleton people at the Hoover Dam. You'd be like, oh yeah, this is all normal now. I think they're trying to convey that before she maybe thought she was seeing things or she was convincing herself that it's all it's all an illusion. Yeah, exactly. Like it was easier to just like not really engage with what she was seeing, but now that she really knows like the lore. It's a little weirder. And then she found Percy Jackson at the high school and she's like, oh no, it was true. Yeah, exactly. So this is like confirming all the stuff that she kind of worried about. And as much as she's like seen these things here and there in glimpses, being right in the labyrinth surrounded by skeletons and stuff is like a different thing altogether. See, this is where like Rachel Elizabeth Dare, she'd be the person that would go to the library and like research all the mythology. Like she seems like the person that perfect example, you have a brainy kid that doesn't have magical powers that has to use, you know, the stories and beat mythology with mythology. I think she would have been like the most perfect subject. Yeah, she's not really like necessarily a mythology nerd or anything. She just sort of sees through the the mist but that's kind of good because i think if she was also a mythology nerd she'd be like too much of an overpowered character in some ways like she could see through the mist and she knows what she's seeing then she we don't get that like interesting fish out of water thing of her like adjusting to the reality of all this mythology stuff existing and i kind of find that interesting in this chapter it's one of the more interesting things going on character wise considering a lot of what we're dealing with is just like a fight scene and stuff so all the stuff with rachel and annabeth and percy and like their weird tense dynamic of like they need rachel because she's helpful and like annabeth knows that but she feels like a weird sense of pride and jealousy about this whole thing so i like all that stuff but then once we actually get to the fight scene i don't really care that much especially because they make two of the characters shut up they cover their mouths my brain just unlocks something stupid and it's this you know why she can see through not the mist but like she can go through and navigate the maze Remember in the mythology, how why does that work for a mortal? I'm not sure. She has to be in love with a demigod. That's the guide them. Yes, it's love. Oh Oh my god. Wait, hold on a second. Is this canon or is this just like a thing that you're 
coming up with. Well, it's so stupid. It has to be true, I believe, because it's you, you have to use Ariadne string. But in the mythology, oh. if I remember correctly, it's a mortal leading a demigod who she's in love with and true love. Because she's in love. Oh, my God. What a sap, Rick. Look at you. That would be weird, honestly, if she was in love with Percy, though, because, like, they've hardly seen each other. Well, love comes into different shapes and sizes, but also when Percy Jackson has saved your life more than three times, maybe you might kind of start having feelings. I guess that's true, but, like, geez. An adolescent crush is enough for you to see through the mist. I don't think that's necessarily true, though. That doesn't... I mean, I could see why that would be, like, a headcanon thing, but it kind of falls apart when you... Um, interrogate a little bit more because she already could see through the mist before she knew Percy. Well, no, no, specifically navigating through the maze, and that's not just seeing through the mist. Right, okay. So it would have to be the maze. So it's true love will guide you to your heart's desire. And with mm. having like Ariadne string, that's just you don't have to be loved like Luke. Like Luke could not find, obviously could not find some a mortal that loves him. But it's kind of like in that situation. Mm -mm. No, he couldn't find a mother that loves him. <laughs> oh, snap. Uh -uh. Only a mother could love that face. The one that was busted up on the rocks. I'll never forget that description of him. Oh, oh, listeners. Oh, oh, listeners. This is going to be great. But so they're like moseying through the maze. They're being super sneaky. And all of a sudden... Oh, no, they get captured because this is what happens in Percy Jackson. Yeah, I guess because it was too easy. Even Rachel says, like, wait, is it supposed to be this easy? It gets a little bit um, suspicious. I was waiting for, like, the Mines of Moria when uh, they accidentally knock the suit of armor down and, like, makes a bunch of noise and they awaken the Balrog and all the orcs. Yeah, or that, that equivalent. They don't even really do that. They just sort of, like, hear a noise. And they're like, oh, wait, it, something bad is happening. And before they could turn around, they realize it's... um. It's too late. It's Luke's gang. The old Kelly the Impusa, which is a pupusa and an empanada combined, as we determined through the Twitter poll. Oh my god, it is an empanada. Delicious. It's her final form. Oh no, and just to add some hummus to that. Oh yeah, no. Yeah, and also the um the Dracone snake people. The, I'm a snake. I'm a snake. Slippy snippy snake. And yeah, I th I thought that was a pretty spot on description you gave of the um the Star Wars cantina scene because that's kind of what happens with the description of I guess what is this like a gladiator arena I guess I would call this. B, it's funny because like you have like this big old like Russell Crowe like gladiator moment, even though gladiator fights are more Roman than they are Greek, but. You know, we can we can move past that. Whatever. Same idea, though. Like, whatever. The fighting that happened in ancient Greece. It's very much like a gladiator ring because, one, you have the thumbs up and you have the thumbs down from the main boss. Right. And then you have everyone cheering in the stands. It's a lot like um, Return of the Jedi with, like, the Rancor pit. And you just have people just being amused by a horrible monster eating other species. Like, that's just something that just happens. Yeah, I mean, that's, like, a trope and a ton of things. It's based off of, like, gladiator mythology type of stuff. But then any kind of, like, I guess, gross, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, masochistic. Sadistic? Or, like, I guess sadistic, yeah. Sa like, sadistic society that, like, sits in a blood sport ring and watches. Yeah, like, blood sport, like, watches people get murdered for fun. Especially the description of it is, you know, all these, all manner of people. It's, you know, different creatures. It's the Dracone, the, it's a bunch of different people. There's demigods in the audience. There's, um, what did Percy say? Um, giants, you name it, bat-winged demons and creatures that seemed half human and half you name it, bird, reptile, insect, mammal. So it's just like a real mess of sort of creepy people in the audience. The snake person appears to fight him. And she has a trident and a weighted net, which is classic gladiator sty style. So glad I think gladiators are Roman and Greek. Like, they're both. I think they were more popularized with the Romans. There are, like, you know, gladiatorial arenas because, you know, the Olympics were formed. And most of the time it was people wrestling nude. How the Romans, like, perfected gladiator fights, you always think of, like, the Roman culture version of it. People fighting lions, people fighting people. Did you know the, um, the Great Colosseum? actually used to be able to be submerged and they'd have actual like boat fights in the middle of the rink. 
Oh yeah, I did. I I have seen pictures of that, or like illustrations of that. Not pictures. That would be weird. But you were there, don't you remember? You were there. <laughs> you took a selfie. Yeah, I actually don't age. I'm like um, Keanu Reeves, so I was actually there. I'm just imagining be your mom's there. B, can you get a picture with me and the lion? <laughs> She's like her head's in the lion's mouth, like giving a thumbs up. And you just see like time travelers just shaking their heads. I don't like the fight just because it's really boring because you know what's going to happen. Percy Jackson's going to end up in the rink. Yeah, it's like not that interesting. The only kind of interesting thing, I guess, is like the whole weakness thing. But really, anytime he fights any monster like this, I guess, I mean, would you describe this guy as, his mo- as a monster and Teus? He's like a giant, right? He's a giant with like red skin. Um, anytime he he fights a character like this, it feels like a boss fight from a video game, sort of, where there's always like the secret, you know, thing. It's the critical spot. You just have to find it, and you do double damage. Yeah, exactly. It's it's that kind of thing. It's like, oh, if you hit them in this exact spot, which I got, I guess I'm sort of like reverse engineering that because in some ways the reason boss fights are like that has to do with a lot of ancient mythology stuff having to do with like the Achilles, you know, heel. fatal flaws and having Achilles heel exactly. So like having a weakness that you know, or I'm thinking of like what's that game where you fight a bunch of giant stone creatures and kill them and Shadow of the Colossus. Shadow of the Colossus, yeah, yeah, it reminds me of that a little bit. I thought you were talking about like boss fights, like in um, not re- like Resident Evil, but like there's like boss rush modes, or even like um, good example. Of this is God of War. That's all ancient mythology, but there's even like weak spots. When you yeah. have a smaller character fighting a big character, there's always like the sort of twist, like aha, but if you only get them in this specific spot, or if you only like figure out what's making them powerful or making them heal in a certain way, then you're able to win the boss fight, so to speak. And that's exactly what he does. And it's revealed pretty early on. He doesn't even really figure it out for himself. Annabeth yells before her mouth is clamped shut again that he's the son of Gaia. So at first, Percy's confused, like, okay, wait, why does this matter to me? Because he's dumb. And I don't know, she's giving him help and he still doesn't understand what's going on. So what Percy Jackson has to do is he has to summon Captain Planet. Got it. Well, at first he thinks, oh, well, Gaia, you know, she's like the Earth goddess. And then Poseidon is the god of the ocean. So he maybe he's more powerful. He could talk to horses and use water. Yeah, exactly. He could just he could do it all. But even like before, like this whole fight starts, I like that they kind of show like they, they have another person in the rink, which is like another centaur. And it's like a really sad scene because like his the centaur's all broken up. He has like a broken leg. And they don't, they do like a weird like jump cut, even in this story where Percy Jackson looks away, Rick Ryden has to describe it. And when Percy Jackson turns his head again, he's already disappeared. Like it was too gruesome. Like that seems like an edit to me. Right. Yeah. They kind of cut out the description of what happens, which I mean, also he's a centaur, so he doesn't exactly, you know, bleed out or something. He just disappears into dust, which not to say that that's not sad, but at least he's not, you know just like a bloody stump he has to look at b he does go to the giant horse girl ranch in the sky okay i hope so yeah that's like really upsetting because specifically like the way that they're like oh well we'll kill your friends if you help this character i don't know we don't know the name of the centaur but that's like such a specifically hurtful thing to percy as someone who you know always wants to help and wants to do the right thing and but he also is really loyal and cares about his friends so it's like this horrible you know, choice he has to make where he has to, like, turn, you know, the other cheek and just, like, let them murder this centaur. It's pretty upsetting. Honestly, that's... It's not a fun part of this chapter, but it is a compelling one as far as, like, things that they describe. All that kind of weird cruelty is kind of more interesting than the actual fight. Well, yes, because here's the thing. We're looking at this. This is Luke's world. He has his army here, and this is kind of like how Luke, like, kind of corrupts people, but also... He's trying to, like, weaken Percy, like, by showing the most horrifying things possible, you break down that character. Once again, going back to, like, Joseph Campbell and the monomyth, you have to break down the character until he's to the lowest point before he can, like, either get, like, a new power, like, rise up. It's hard to see here because it's, like, Luke's in a point of power. Like, he's literally, like, above Percy. Like, he's pretty much on a throne. And he's also powerless because he's at the whim of giant red dude. Who I keep forgetting yeah, his well, name. Yeah, because that's what I'm... he's trying to do. Antaeus? Antaeus. So Antaeus, yeah, the whole reason that Luke is there is only because he's like playing this sort of political game where- He's playing the Game of Thrones. 
You either win or you die. Yeah, where if he if he like entertains this guy with the right kind of gladiatorial fights, then they'll let them pass safely through his territory, I guess, because his territory is in the way of what I imagine to be what Daedalus's like workshop or what do you think it's either like luke tries to pass through his territory safely or he ends up at the goblin king with jareth and luke will have to get like a baby and it'll be a whole mess (laughs) it's a whole thing it's really such a mess first you gotta find jennifer Connolly, then you gotta find her baby wait not her baby her baby brother (laughs) oh no we're is this a plot twist to the the labyrinth this is the sequel to labyrinth where she wants to kill her son and sends him whisks him away to the goblin king and david bowie's just calls up like child support he's actually a good guy he's like wait a second this is messed up well that's because like you you would think susan would be terrible in the future too if she's terrible to her little baby brother oh my god oh yeah she'd she'd not be a good parent anyway it's kind of a miracle that we don't talk about labyrinth the movie in every episode when we talk about this book but anyway it's funny because like even even with the situation, like, Luke's in a place where he thinks he's in power, but not really because he's in the whim of this random monster. Yeah, well, that's kind of what Luke often is, right? He's always, like, kind of sucking up to these different powerful beings to kind of gain some of their power and use them to his advantage, whether it be him and Kronos. Like, he's always trying to, like, you know, finagle some sort of deal with these creatures, and it's not smart really but you know oh yes he's the corporate butt smoocher yeah he like he'll he'll make a deal with the devil in a second because he just wants what he wants and like it's really his whole cause is getting very like lost in the whole mix where it's like oh well i don't like gods because they do x y and z so of course i'm gonna ally myself with monsters and titans and it's like are you though are those any better it just it doesn't really ideologically make a lot of sense because at this point he's just sort of a suck up well he has to be that's the funny thing that people i don't understand about luke is that like people love luke but yet you see all this stuff and every sentence he's in he just becomes more pathetic it's actually kind of funny it's like a like a sliding scale down of just like he's willing to like lick the boots of anybody if it means possibly getting a little power yeah exactly like he's he's all about asserting power and i think it has a lot to do with him feeling powerless to the system of being a demigod and he's like oh well they're telling me to go on these quests and they're telling me to prove my worth as a hero and x y and z and he makes some valid points way back when when he's talking to percy with the scorpion and all of that but so much of that gets lost when you actually look at his actions where you're like okay well you just want to feel some sense of power so you're subservient like making yourself subservient to just a different group of people instead of it being the gods it's the titans or it's you know some monster you found in the labyrinth it's the same thing well it's like most psychopaths like that end up making manifestos like their manifestos can make sense to a crazy person but then like you go into like human like nature and human error and like they'll go against their own manifesto it's weird yeah well that's sort of like i don't even think he his manifesto is all that crazy if he were to actually write down what he believes and why he's doing what he's doing you know what i mean because Percy agrees with it to some extent like he you know we've been tackling with this issue from the first book and we tackled with it a little bit when Percy talks to Calypso and is like oh well do you always agree with your parents well I agreed with mine what makes that any different if I agree with my parents and their titans like it, it's really bringing to the fore like the concept of like okay there's gray area in terms of good and evil and do you always like follow what your parents say I totally get that and in some ways Percy gets that he you know when he's not even claimed by his dad in the first book and he has all these questions about who his parents are and there's an understandable kernel of truth to what luke is saying but so much of his actions have nothing to do with any of that it's just him trying to feel some sense of power what makes a good villain is like you can kind of understand like what they're coming from like thanos is a is a great villain because he's crazy but like he like brings up like this rational plan like well i'm gonna wipe out half the galaxy because people are gonna like be overpopulated everyone's gonna starve because this is what happened to my people so i'm gonna prevent 
this by killing half the population. Okay, that makes sense. And then you get to end game, like you see how the world is, even though it's depressing. It's like Thanos kind of had a point originally, but like he's still crazy. Yeah. Did I tell you that I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said Thanos twenty twenty? <laughs> I did. In the wilds. I don't want Thanos as my president because he'd make a terrible no. president. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, today uh, only half of you guys will be allowed to eat. The other half to have to build more statues of me. Yeah, that's probably. My vice president is just Karen Gillian. That's okay. <laughs> He's not like that dissimilar in physical description to um, Thanos and Teus, honestly. No, Thanos, yeah, they're, they're both monsters with colorful skin. And they they have, like, weird chins. They look like Grimace. Yeah, does he have a weird chin? I mean, maybe Antaeus does have a weird chin. They don't describe it. He's just red Thanos. He's red Thanos, yeah. There's a whole rainbow of them, and then you get the infinity gauntlet, and you fill them with each color of the Thanoses. B, you get the infinity Thanos. Yeah, and then they each put on a, their own infinity gauntlet, and then you put that on, and it's really... It's turtles all the way down. You know, it's even my favorite thing that I read this week was that that our brains are in skeletal mech suits. No, oh, I don't want to hear that. Why did you have to say that? Yeah, so technically our brains are piloting like skin and flesh mech suits, and I love this. No. Yes. T- put it back. I don't want to know about it. How do you... Okay, Google, how do you unlearn something? <laughs> B, my brain and my skin is drift compatible. <laughs> no, this is the worst. Uh, it's either this or we keep talking about Rainbow Thanos, so we get the ultimate Thanos. Or maybe we could talk about the plot of the book. <laughs> what a concept. Oh, oh my god. Uh, so Percy Jackson ends up in the ring, and what do you think happens? He kicks butt, he gets rid of a couple beasties, and it's great, but then he has to go mono e mono. Yeah, well, he, so he fights the Dracone. He also fights... What is there? There's also another monster after that. Well, he just... Okay, just miscellaneous sports montage. Oh, yeah, he fights a demigod, doesn't he? And yes. then the demigod is like, hey, so I really want to impress them. Well, this is uh, actually my, like... This is my initiation if I kill you. Because the way they have him, like, set up, he's Japanese. For some reason, he's the same age as Percy, but also has a cool eye patch. Because he's awesome. Yeah, well, I guess something happened. I imagine that's how the eye patch happened. No, not necessarily, because pirates. Um, when you think of pirates, you think of eye patches, right? Oh, right. Yeah. No, I know this. It's so your eyes can adjust the dark. Is that the thing? Yeah. Yes. So for people that don't know, a lot of pirates didn't actually have their eyes gouged out. They would actually just put an eye patch on their eye. So like when they were like above deck, like it's oh it's bright and sunny, but when they need to go below deck, you have a hard time seeing, so you don't want to like stumble and fall. Well, you take the eye patch off and your eyes are already adjusted to the light. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. I'm Zach. Yeah, arr. Welcome to the Arr cast. Arr, matey. Afterwards, we'll get some Arby's. Shiver me timbers. I want some cheesecake bites. <laughs> <laughs> I, he who hesitates, is lost. Okay. Are we going to do the pirate bit for a while, or are we going to... Are yeah, well, we could have done... You just hate this chapter so much, you just want to do a bit. You just, like, don't even want to engage. Are B, don't you... We could have... If we wanted to do a pirate bit, we would have done it with the Queen Anne's Revenge. Yeah, we would have. Did we? Did that happen? I don't remember what we did when we read that chapter. It was a while ago. I think I just had a stroke, and I think I'm a pirate now, a salty dog. And he's a pirate forever, folks. Let me he's go, trapped. Let me go get my puffy shirt. Mm-hmm. His timbers have been shivered. <laughs> There's no fixing it. No, my timbers have been shivered and my wrestles have been jimmied. Your wrestles have been jimmied? <laughs> Which means going up to all your friends named Russell and naming them Jimmy. Yes. Okay, I think my stroke's over, so we can we can move forward. Uh, really? Because so- I think you've been having one for 20-odd years. It's called a, a very slow uh, stroke. Gradu- gradual cerebral degeneration brought on by watching horror movies 24-7. Oh, yes, that's that's where it comes from, B. But yeah, so what ends up happening is Percy Jackson ends up in the ring with Red Thanos. Red Thanos. Yes. Ranos. No, yeah, no that, that doesn't work. That works. That's, it's Ranos, but he also plays Run DMC. That's his like stage entrance music. Yeah, I would call him Red, but we already have a Red, so that's... 
No, no, you call them. So you have red, and then you have red R E D D. Red too, even redder. Bloodier and reddier. Yeah, we're saying red, but it's actually read. It's just you can't tell when you read it on the paper. Uh, okay, I'm just making homonym jokes. Or no, is that it? Yeah, when it sounds the same. Homonym. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway. but so it gets into the fight, and you know. Uh, he got into one little fight, and his mom got scared, so Percy Jackson in the next book ends up in Bel Air. Yeah, and then he became the um, Gemini Man. What is that <laughs> The movie Gemini. Oh, that Ang Lee movie. Oh, it's terrible looking. I was laughing. I went to the movies yesterday, and I was dying, because that, look- that trailer- Did you see it? No, that movie- I saw Scary Stories That Tell in the Dark, but that trailer played, and it looks horrendous, that movie. Yeah, the movie doesn't look great. The CGI is impressive, like the technology, but you know. It's still Will Smith aged really young, but it still looks fake. It's not Grand Moff Tarkin, because they actually do have Will Smith there doing all like the acting and stuff, but like Yeah, and then they used old footage. I saw a video about it, it was actually pretty cool that they um they like edit it to make it look like young him, like on a VHS tape. It was really cool. I would like it if they would just do the Fresh Prince of Bel Air reboot and just make. No, that's what they were talking about in the video. He's like, we could just make another Fresh Prince. I, I'd be fine with that. I like my Fresh it Prince. Would kind of be eerie though. Like, here's the CGI Fresh Prince. Maybe we could move on from there. Well, no, but... it would be like so they'd they'd have to get Will Smith, but then they'll have to like CGI Uncle Phil, and just everyone everyone that's dead comes back. Yeah, that's not in bad taste at all. It's just like the the Tupac hologram. No, Tupac hologram. Remember the Bruce Lee when he was trying to sell, I think, chips? Oh, yeah. Did, did they do that for, like, pop chips or something? It was for pop chips. Like it, pop chips are always doing offensive stuff. What is with them? There was that one, and then there was the one with, what's that actress's name? Uh, she sold Coca-Cola. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, Audrey Hepburn. Yes, Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. See, this technology doesn't work that well. No, she was, cho- uh, she was selling chocolate, I think. She was, okay, I thought it was Coca-Cola, but yeah, yeah chocolate. And then they were like, oh, well, she loved chocolate, <laughs> which is a kind of funny justification for that. I mean, we are so distracted right now. I am so sorry, everybody. I think we Yeah, have- we just don't really care about... I mean, like, what happens? What? he? Okay, so he fights Red Thanos, and what happens? He wins, wins he wins. obviously. And it's not like... He, he does look at mythology, like, lesson, but it isn't infotainment because it was just like, well, he figured out the weak spot and killed him. Well, he didn't even figure it out, first of all. Annabeth figured it out. Annabeth did. But wait, this is where I guess this is called character progression because I just remembered through my stroke something I wanted to talk about. And that is Percy Jackson, before the fight, he's like, I want you to swear on the river sticks. Oh, yes. Okay. He did remember that. I did notice that. He's been paying attention. Oh, my God. He's growing up so fast. Our baby. He's learning. He's learning. A little bit at a time. He's not an idiot. Well, I wouldn't go that far. But he's our idiot. He doesn't have to stick a tongue his tongue in a light bulb to electrocute himself. He just needs to go in an airplane. <laughs> or hang out with Thalia. Yeah. Uh, Make Zeus angry by existing. Wait, what is he going to do? Dab on a cliff? <laughs> I dare you to shock me. And he just dabs and then falls off the cliff as he gets struck by lightning. Yeet. His Wilhelm screams all the way down the cliff. Uh, but pretty much the fight happens and Luke's just like, oh, this, this is bad. Kill them! Seize them! Yeah. Oh, so wait, I, we didn't really describe exactly how he figured out the weakness. Annabeth, before her mouth gets slammed shut, is she's like, oh, he's the son of Gaia. Gaia is the Earth goddess, blah, blah, blah. So, like, that's how he keeps healing himself. Every time he gets stabbed, a bunch of sand falls out of him, but then, like, the Earth rises up and kind of heals him, and he busts out of the dirt, and he's perfectly healed. So if he can't touch the ground, then he can heal. Ergo, he dies, which again, this reminds me a lot of that where the wild things are seen. I mentioned a couple episodes ago where they like cut the arm off of one of the wild things and all the sand pours out. So what you're telling me, B, is this is what Percy Jackson does. Uh, he has to Naruto run fast enough to make sure the guy doesn't land on the ground to kill him. Basically. Well, he like he strings him up in a bunch of chains. Yes. This is like this is very like edgy. You know, he's trains. It's, it's kind of creepy. Uh, but Percy Jackson defeats him. And guess what? Luke is like, oh, this is terrible. Everyone, uh, kill Percy Jackson. I don't want to do it myself. I don't want to jump in this ring and, and fight him. Yeah, but spare Annabeth for no particular reason. Um, I, I wonder why. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of like the Nemoinians in like, the Star Wars the prequels where they're idiots. There's like one that's like, uh, are they dead? Shoot them or something. 
I don't know, just whatever, deal with them. I don't, yeah, that's kind of the vibe I get from Luke. He's very bad at, like, actionable offense. Like, he's always kind of standing there doing the talk, but maybe not walking the walk. Like, he doesn't just, like, run after them. He's like, uh, the, the people, they've escaped and get them. And he's kind of becoming more ineffectual as the books go on, I feel like. He feels like less of a threat, even though he has more of an army. But that kind of drives home how little he intimidates Percy because he even says oh like oh, I should have killed you when I had the chance and he's like well you tried like yeah you did try to kill me and you didn't win buddy so let's do you want to play that again the thing with Luke is that he's like he's like super cowardly though like he's like I'm a I'm a badass I'm awesome oh yeah yeah but then like when he's in a situation where like there's a bunch of people watching him he's like ah uh, yeah, I, I can't fight you because, uh, Percy, I just, like, ate a panini and I can't fight you for an hour. It's like swimming rules. Yeah, he also has, basically. like, a, a, a nerdy voice. Uh, but, yeah, I think the, as the series progresses, like, Luke becomes more pathetic. I think that's kind of the point Rick's trying to get is, like, power corrupts, but if you're, like, a person that doesn't know how to handle it, you just become, like, more pathetic as you're trying to use it to the point of where people are going to, like, have, like, a schism almost. It's like, um... Series of unfortunate events with um when they're on the, the slippery slope and you know the powered face women leave. It's the exact type of situation where it's just like, yeah, you're stupid and we're not doing this. Okay, bye. He doesn't have like the sort of um gravitas to really make people listen to him necessarily. So like when he is like demanding people, it's sort of like this kerfuffle of everyone sort of clamoring to chase after Percy and the gang. And they're not doing a really great job, and he's not very good at leading people necessarily and uh, because he is allying himself with like mercenaries and monsters and all these people who don't they really have no give allegiance. A, they, exactly. They don't care about him. So it's not like a very smart strategy. No. And it's an interesting aspect where you have like true Luke has probably the bigger force of people. But the problem, though, is that no one wants to follow him because, you know, money talks, but loyalty is much more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the vibe I get. I mean, they do try to help him a little bit, but I think it's more out of their just, like, general distaste for Half-Bloods and less, less like, oh, I need to specifically follow Luke and what he has to say. Because, like, who cares what Luke has to say? Nobody. No one cares. It's just how much they pay him. Yeah, basically. Well, no, I think how they defeat him is actually kind of funny because Percy Jackson, even against his best judgment, he's pretty much like, I'm just going to use his magical whistle. I know that... um Pretty much Quintus is just this evil jerk face that has betrayed us, but I'm going to use Miss O'Leary, and that's great. I love that. All the puppy wanted to do was give kisses. A puppy ex machina, and she just sort of appears and is the adorable murderous dog that we all hope to see in the world. Part of me is like, oh, that's kind of a cop out, but I don't know how else this chapter could have ended, because then it would have just been like, what? Okay, now we have to deal with Luke, and what? Are we going to have another fight scene? I don't want to see nothing I hate worse in the Percy Jackson series is like when he fights something and then he has to face another villain who he's fighting and it's just like a chain of fight scenes and I'm like I don't care about this I always think about like in Spongebob when they did like the Fry Olympics and Patrick comes in like this <laughs> gigantic monster thing and then the yeah. monster thing turns around and there's just Patrick yeah it's, it's like that uh, though Percy Jackson does show some mercy and how he pretty much tells like that one uh, little boy I think his name's Ethan Nakamura He's like, go, be free. He's like, yeah, find your exit. And then he does. And he sort of like books it out of there, too. And um, well, everyone's distracted by the giant. B, this sounds like Percy Jackson now has a life debt as if something might happen with us. Because you don't just give a character a name that's random and show him mercy. That's true. He has a full name. As we've established with Rachel Elizabeth Dare, you give a character a full name and they're going to want a full backstory. <laughs> it's like if you give him as a cookie. No, if you give a mouse a cookie, he'll want two cookies. If you give a mouse more cookies, oh no, he'll develop a, a t terrible cookie addiction. Stop. Stop giving him cookies. Mm -hmm, and that is, that's his tragic backstory. <laughs> oh no. D just a, Okay. Here's an idea for a movie. If you give a mouse a cookie versus the cookie monster, kaiju movie. Wait, is he piloting the cookie monster? No, B, the mouse is piloting a gigantic cookie mecha robot. It's, and it's like shaped fighting as a cookie. The cookie monster. Yes. Trying to lead him away from the Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. I'm working on this movie. I'm workshopping it. I'm workshopping it. 
the movie's gonna be you know cookie v monster if you give him as a cookie monster that's obvious oh that's a that's a good one how did we get here zach how do how do we always get here uh it's well it's closing time friend <laughs> I mean, like that's. I mean, that's the end of the chapter. Basically, they just they book it and they give a character a name, and so we're probably gonna see him again. Like I said before, like there's a lot of things we could talk about with this chapter, but it's just I I pretty much summed it up in the beginning of this chapter. Percy Jackson gets captured, fights some things, and then leaves. That's pretty much it. It's it's boring. Like we're really like scatterbrained today, but that's mainly because nothing really happens. There wasn't really for much for us to dissect. Yeah, not a lot of plot stuff. Like, there isn't any um, dream stuff. There's no vision stuff that he has. We don't really find out a ton of things about, like, backstory, whether it be about the characters. I mean, we know that we're done, basically, with all the flashbacks regarding Daedalus, because, like, that's kind of what you were talking about. I think it was last episode. Like, they put a pretty fine point on, like, okay, well, this is where we where we left Daedalus the last time. So we're, we're kind of caught up with him and his story. So we're just kind of waiting for them to meet again. Unless Percy Jackson gets a new flashback sequence where you see Daedalus now as a robot puts on like a, like a hat and he turns out he's actually Abraham Lincoln, like Mecca. Well, yeah, speaking of, of, of mechs, because we did establish that, you know, he's probably inside of a robot. Oh, see, that, that brings back my theory about your brain is actually in a mech suit. It's true. He's truly going to be exactly that. Um, only it's not going to be a flesh and bone. It'll be of his own devising. Uh, yes. Not flesh and bone. Bone and flesh. Oh, geez. I just looked at the name of the next chapter, and I feel like it really jumps off of what we were just talking about. So, B, what is the name of the next chapter? Uh, we steal some slightly used wings. Oh, no. This sounds terrible. I'm, I'm getting to feel like they're going to maybe find Daedalus. That sounds like a real Icarus situation with some wings. Or they might find Icarus. Yeah. They'll find like his corpse and oh. steal his wings. Yikes. I mean, did he fall into the ocean though? Yeah, well, the ocean could fall into the labyrinth. You don't know this. Yeah, that's true. The labyrinth is connected all over. Yeah, so who knows? But something like that. B, the problem though is Percy Jackson couldn't put on those wings because the second he's in the sky, he's going to be electrocuted. That's true. You're right. So, not exactly the most useful tool. Oh no, be the only one that could do it would be Rachel Elizabeth Dare. Yeah, that would be a heck of a look. Her with the wings and then like the full gold body paint from earlier and she's just like, you know, the winged Nike just gliding through the sky. That's an aesthetic that I would love to have painted on the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen? Oh, geez. I mean, that's kind of the closest guess I could have is that either they find wings that belonged to Daedalus and or Icarus. I don't exactly know how. Or maybe it's something completely different involving wings, but that's kind of my guess because we are we are getting closer to Daedalus, right? We have to be because we're, we're, what, almost we're on done chapter with this book. 15. Chapter, what, 19 is the last one? So Whoa, whoa. We're almost there. We're very close. Yeah, we're getting there. Yes. So, B, you ready to read some emails? Okay, so yeah, we have a few listener emails. First is from James, who says, I have ADHD, and it is really easy for me to memorize phone numbers and regular numbers. You might want to take into account that I am a great ahead in math. Um, sincerely, fearless leader. Also, Rachel Elizabeth Dare is probably fake because her initials are R-E-D. Red, I say. Red. We did point that out. I don't think her name is fake. I just think that that's just, you know, Rick Riordan being cheeky. Well, no, that's the name you give to a serial killer after she's wiped her hands clean of the red blood. <laughs> one of these, I would love for someone to make that into a shirt. I feel like we should just start making new shirts. And I want one of like, um, like making a murderer, but with like Rachel Elizabeth there. Yeah. If I was um more of an artist, which I mean, I can kind of draw, but if I could do like cartooning. I would definitely draw a lot of hilarious Rachel Elizabeth Dare head cannons. Oh man, yeah, that was, that was a great email. But uh, to answer that, uh, the statement you had, I think everyone's different when it comes to like I can barely remember phone numbers. Yeah, I don't think that they were trying to make it a thing about Percy that he can remember phone numbers because of the ADHD thing. I'm I'm guessing it more has to do with him, you know, Liking being her. into Rachel. Yeah, that's the way it's written anyway. The implication is that. 
also like this is going back to like the you know the english teacher like the curtains are blue like we're looking into things way too deeply at times so that might not even have been the case yeah yeah no i mean like it's it was intentionally written that way i think if you look at the phrasing of it, it's like oh well even though it had worn away long ago he still remembered the number and then that paired with some of the other ways in which he zeroes in on rachel's face or hair and like describes her in a way that's like more than the way that you would describe a friend i i do think that that's what rick Riordan's trying to do subtly with his writing so i yeah i mean you could head canon that's part of why he was able to remember it because you know you could really like a person and still not remember the phone number but that's my guess is what that's what they were trying to convey but you can try really really hard so we got an email from g trumpet hey guys I've been listening to your podcast on Spotify for a few weeks now, and I can't thank you enough. I've been looking for something along the lines of what you do, discussing the booms and whatnot for a while. I'm only on chapter 14 of the first book episodes, but I may skip around a bit since I've read the series a couple of times. Enjoy listening while I ride my bicycle to and from work during the week. Also, in the last episode I listened to, you mentioned something about wanting an opening. I play the ukulele a bit. Honestly, I'm not very good, but I thought it would... Uh, put this little intro together for you. If you like it, I can make a better recording. Let me know when I can and I can get something together. Thanks again. And I'm going to play that right now, guys. So listen to this. Gather around the microphone. Talk about things we read. And your friends. Zach and me. Wow, that was amazing. Oh my god, B, can you believe that's an intro musical that we got? Yeah, you sent that to me on um, Facebook chat earlier this week, and I was like blown away by how adorable it was. It's very sweet. I actually had to call the hospital because B, their heart grew like 18 sizes yeah, bigger. Yeah, it's true. They had to like rush me off on a stretcher. Um, they also had to to pull all my teeth because of the cavities of how sweet it was it was like a very adorable song i'm just imagining they have to give you like 10 cc's of being like cynical yeah to make your heart go down Mm -hmm. yeah my normal level of cynical but thank you so much we would like to have a better recording of this but also we'd like to open this up to the floor if anyone wants to submit an intro we're thinking about making one but we like to give people a shot if you guys want to do it give it to us before the end of october so on halloween october 31st and then we're going to put it up for a vote, whatever wins, or we'll put it as the official intro. Yeah, that that seems fair, because as much as I really like this one, it was sort of, I guess, would be a first come, first serve thing of like, oh, you're the first person to send us a little intro. But I want to give other people a shot if they wanted to, or if they've been meaning to do it. Because we have a lot of people that like Tumblr, and everyone that likes Tumblr, I've done a scientific fact about this, either plays a ukulele or a small instrument. It's true, I play ukulele. I play the ukulele. B, do you have a Tumblr? Yeah, I do. I had a Tumblr. Mia had a Tumblr. M- Mia also plays the ukulele. My ex had a Tumblr, also played the ukulele. Just really, it's true. One time in college, okay, this is like not totally related, but um, my sister was like talking to uh, someone else who was on campus and she was like, Ugh, I saw a freshman moving in today. And they had a ukulele case and like said it like really disgusted, like, oh my God, can you imagine the the cloying whimsy? And then she, my sister just turned to this person and was like, um, my twin hat brought their ukulele to campus also. And it just sort of, it was not the right audience to be saying that, but, um. Oh no, all those Tumblr people. Well, I mean, have you ever been to Bard? It makes sense. No, I have not. You're no, going to take me well, to Bard? Yeah. The description, I'm saying, like, if you've ever been to the campus, or if you understand their culture, you understand why there'd be so many ukulele players. It just makes a lot of sense. It's sort of like Tumblr, the college. Oh, my God. That reminds me. Oh, God. Okay. If we're talking about embarrassing ukulele stories. Oh, no. uh, There was this girl. I used to be, like, a personal aide in high school, because for senior year, I got to have a free period, so I hung out with one of my favorite teachers, and he had this girl who she would... Okay, I'm just going to sum this up, and... You, you can say what you will. Uh, she would come to class dressed in Homestuck and she would have the paint on. Oh, yeah. You told me this. Wh- oh, yeah. And so she would bring her ukulele and she would like cause scenes almost every day. No. And her brother was a brony. Of course. They're the same thing. Really. Homestucks and bronies. They're just. It's the two genders. <laughs> Homestucks and bronies. 
<laughs> like I got like I got chills, like the kind that's like embarrassing. Like if you ever watch The Office and you see Michael Scott doing something super embarrassing, you just feel bad for everybody. Yeah, the secondhand embarrassment. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, I had oh, secondhand cringe. embarrassment. Oh, the cringe. Did I tell you about the person? Okay, this is just becoming a roast session for weird people. But there was someone who went to my high school who. I'll tell you her name after we're recording because it is... It is does, she famous? No, it's just it adds to the story that her name it was just very funny, but she was like sitting in class and she had like this weird... I don't know what, what else to describe it other than like a scroll. I don't know, like a, a golden scroll scepter thing. It was a scepter. She had a scepter. I don't know. She brought it into school every day. I wasn't in the class, but she dropped it once and like sort of let out a gasp of exasperation as if to think, oh, my precious scepter. And Sarah witnessed this whole thing because it was in her class. And she just sort of was like, what the frick is wrong with this girl? Like, why does she have a scepter? So, B, did we get any other messages? Uh, yeah, we got an email from Anna who says, Hi, guys, I'm Anna, a daughter of Aphrodite and 11 years old. I think your podcast is completely amazing. I have to emphasize that every other letter is capitalized in that word amazing i'm only on episode 75 so i'm a bit behind anyway i am that type of kid b talked about when i read book series i read a book series i mean when i found your podcast i was crying with joy i finally feel like i can express my feelings none and i mean none of my friends have read percy jackson but now i have you guys who i consider my friends hope that's not weird to listen to uh i do admit to yelling at my phone sometimes it's normally when b guesses plot points super accurately i don't know how zach keeps it together i imagine him laughing maniacally after each episode i've read the percy jackson series over maybe five times each and i have loved every second of it keep staying mortal goodbye from your australian friend anna uh or possibly anna sorry if i mispronounced for that uh please read this on the show if you have time we just did <laughs> wow yeah we just did and <clears throat> to answer your question about me I have a lot of experience with holding truths because my entire job is me signing papers away that tell me I can't talk about it. That's true. You, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, is, what are those called again? Those um, Non-disclosure agreements. Non-disclosure um, agreements. If you ever work in entertainment yeah. where you have to deal with projects and you say something, they can sue you. So don't say anything. It's great. Don't do it. When I went to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge uh, for one of the preview nights... Uh, we had to put all of our phone cases in little baggies, and people were like going insane. I was just like, oh, this is just normal for me. But we did get a bunch of iTunes reviews. Do you want to read some, B? Uh, yeah, we have one from Shelly Belly456789, who says, Amazing podcast! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, five stars. Hey, B and Zach! Exclamation point, exclamation point. I love you guys and how you are revealing the Percy Jackson. Oh, sorry, reviewing the Percy Jackson books. I love how you guys are going chapter by chapter. I hope you guys go through the sequel series. We probably will. Check in with us in a year or five. Uh, we're going to be here for a while. Maybe check into us when we're all spooky skeletons. And this will be the only thing that's recorded in human history. Because I'm shooting this out into space. Engrave it on a gold disc and shoot it towards the Andromeda galaxy. So we got an iTunes review from Purple Person 44 I wanted to say for the longest time, the Purple People Eater but that's wrong. That's the purple person. So they will be eaten by the purple people eater. <laughs> oh my God. Is it a one-eyed, one, one mouth? one flying purple people eater. Yeah. Yes. Getting into Halloween spirit already. Wow. We got, we got a reference to that and the monster mash in the same episode. Man, this episode's turning into like a graveyard smash. Okay, wait. Did I ever tell you about <laughs> the Transylvania twist? B, before you talk about it, let me read this, and then we- Okay, read the, read the review, but I just wanted to see. I have not heard about this, so it says, good stuff. Just want to say thanks. It's a good podcast. It's funny. Now, B, can I tell you about my lord and savior, the now pumpkin spice spam that they're going to start spelling? Spam? Do you know about this? Yes. Spam's uh, going to have pumpkin spice, and that's... I don't know how to feel about this. I mean, I'll put pumpkin spice on, like, a roast chicken- with some apples and stuff. I don't know about processed ham. I don't know about that. I am skeptic. I'll try it once and then I'll die because of how disgusting it is. And I'll meet you in Hades. Okay. I can't wait to meet you. Okay. So what is the Transylvania twist? If you've ever listened to the Monster Mash, they make a reference to the Transylvania twist. Because it's on the same comedy album where the Monster Mash originally appeared. So they go, oh, the Transylvania twist. And we're like, wait a second. Okay, so the Monster Mash, a very popular Halloween song, 
most people couldn't tell you who sings it. I can't. I know this fun fact, and I still don't remember who sings it. Whatever. <laughs> it's, for some reason, has persisted through the years as a novelty song that's played at every Halloween party for children and adults alike. Yes. The Transylvania Twist. Where's that? Is that a real song? It is. It, they're referencing an actual song on the same album. So why isn't this famous? Me and Sarah looked it up and listened to the Transylvania Twist. And do you know why it's not famous? It's garbage. It's the worst song I've ever heard. It sounds like someone's having a stroke while doing <laughs> an impression of the Count from Sesame Street. It's horrible. It's. Please look it up just so you could suffer. Because it doesn't even really have a melody. What the Monster Match thrives on even though it's repetitive and ridiculous is it's kind of catchy and repetitive and you know it gets stuck in your head the transylvania twist i couldn't tell you what the melody is it's just sort of like weird clattering and a guy going hey, i'm a vampire it's the worst it's the worst thing i've ever listened to i just i don't know i wanted people to just suffer with me i guess look it up and listen and understand how bad this song is uh listeners i had to get b out of the room i had to get security they were getting very visibly very angry irate. about the Yes. It, I've never seen someone so mad about a song that no one cares about. That's the thing, though. That's I was like, oh, another Halloween song. We could put it on our Halloween party playlist. This was like a year ago when I was planning for my Halloween Wait, party. Wait, did I, I probably listen to that song? No, we didn't too. put it on the playlist because it's garbage, Zach. <laughs> I remember half of it because... Uh, last year we had a nice Halloween party where I came over and we watched Halloween Town where I remember about half of it and then booze happened. Yeah, yeah, you had a, a nice drowsy a nice drowsy time criticizing the mom from Halloween Town. <laughs> With Sarah. I'm not I'm throwing her under the bus too. We had like a very nice discussion about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. You were making a whole sort sort of headcanon situation about what was going on with the mom. Gwen, I don't know why I know that. I do know why I know that, because I've watched that movie every year since 1991. And I was born in 1993, so that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but we did get one more iTunes review, and it's from Soccer Girl Wayne Wing 2. I wanted to say Soccer Wing Wayne's World 2 for the longest time, but I had to... Party on, excellent. Um, hi, I love your podcast so much. I just found you guys, and I'm almost caught up. Thank you, guys. A lot of people are catching up, and that's great. I mean, we're almost 100 episodes in, so... Yeah, how many episodes do we have on on iTunes? I didn't actually look. I think like 80, 85 or 86. I don't keep track. We have bum, 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 86. as a, Well, the, this one will be 87, I guess? We'll be 87. Mm -hmm. This will be 87. So we're getting up there. Oh, my God. Have you ever done 100 episodes of anything? No, I have not. I mean, I've done a collective hundred episodes between this and um, Unfortunate Associates because we got to about 56 so far. Yeah, it's crazy. We're going to have some special plans, hopefully, for the hundredth anniversary. Yeah, exciting stuff. I think we're going to end up going to the Empire State Building and demanding to meet Zeus to do a live show, but I don't know how that's going to work. I'll be escorted off the premises and be put on a list. They're going to think we're crazy, and then you're going to have the one security guard at the desk who's just, it's a cameo Rick Riordan security. Uh, it's like when we went to the 9-11 the memorial, and I had a wrench in my bag for, like, fixing my car. And they were like, are you going to, is this a weapon? It's like, yes, I'm going to dismantle the 9-11 museum brick by brick, screw by screw. Like, it almost seemed like a Seinfeld joke. Yeah, no, it's pretty messed up. It, I was upset in the moment, but it's pretty funny looking back on it. Well, yeah, I, I, I was there. I was like, oh, my God. And then uh, we'll end up talking about that because that experience, was as much as it was fun, pissed me off to my core with how people act. Well, I, I emailed them. Did I tell you that? Oh, you did? You, oh, yeah, you've sent me that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, they were like, they apologized because they were like... That was probably not the best way to handle that situation, but no. But if you if you're in New York, you should go to the World Trade Center Memorial. It's a very nice museum, and it's very heavy, though. You you will cry. I definitely cried oh, I for cried. multiple reasons, but you know they actually have a room that we went to to cry. To cry. It was the crying room. I mean, it wasn't. It was the family room, but it was also the crying room. Yes, it was crazy and beautiful and crazy and beautiful. Yeah. On a less depressing note, B, I can hold my breath for this long. <gasps> and now he's dead, folks. Help. <laughs> okay. Now that I've lightened the mood up, um, 
B, uh, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at B. Kelly Gorman. And you can find me on Tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can follow me at Suda41. That's S-U-D-A-4-1. If you want to follow our show on Twitter, that's at Halfblood underscore radio. We have a Patreon, Patreon slash Radio Camp Halfblood. We're actually going to be doing a bonus episode uh, soon. We're going to be doing the book Be More Chill. That's going to be fun. Yep, just got my ebook a couple days ago. I'm excited to read it. So we're going to start doing more bonus content. We found some time. We got some things in the works, and it's going to be very exciting. So we're going to start with that book, and then we're going to go from there. Yeah. Um. Too bad we wouldn't. We weren't able to see the musical when it was happening. Yeah. No. B. I really wanted to see that musical, though. I haven't had a chance to listen to the album yet because I have this thing where, like, if I want to see a musical that's based off either like a book or a piece of media, I like to watch it first to get context. Otherwise, I have no idea what's happening. Try try listening to the Heather's musical without understanding what Heather's is. It is weird. Yeah, yeah, I I feel the same way. I haven't like listened to um, I must said Hannibal. I haven't listened to Hamilton for that reason. Will be fun fact. There was supposed to be a Silence of the Lamb musical. I saw it. It was oh bad. yeah, right. Yes, you've told me this. Anyway, <laughs> very different than Hamilton. No. Yeah. Oh, actually, I'd love to see Hannibal the musical. That isn't it Silence of the Lamb. It's just Maz Nicholson just being awesome. Yeah. And what's his name? Hugh Dancy. They don't call him Dancy for nothing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what, Oh, that's a see. That's a song where like he breaks out into a dance. Though that, that oh, would like, be weird and fourth wall breaking, considering that's the actor's name. I'd love that. <laughs> uh but yeah, I'm I'm excited for that. We have t-shirts available at T Public, so go to tpublic.com and type in Radio Camp Applin. We got our faces on them, and it is rat a cool. I think that's it, B. Um Yeah, do you have any advice for the kids back home? I guess, you know. Don't listen to the Transylvania twist. Yeah, don't. But do actually, I want people to suffer with me. So go, that is your homework. Go and Google the Transylvania twist, listen to it, and then respond by telling me, confirming at how, how terrible it is. Because I, I need someone to understand. Uh, my advice is, well, this episode will be out, but the Percy Jackson, the Lightning Thief musical, which has just hit Broadway. Actually, the tickets will be on sale. It's going to be hitting Broadway in October. Yeah, tickets are on sale next week, I think. No, th- yeah, so this will be out before tickets go on sale because, hold on, let me check my calendar because I definitely... Tickets will be on sale for general admission on the 21st. On the 21st. So that is a Monday? No, that's a Wednesday. So that's next week, like a, a week from now-ish on a Wednesday. So my recommendation is sit by your computer for half an hour and then start mashing F5 very quickly to get those tickets. That's going to be exciting. I'm I'm so jealous, B, that you get to go to that again if you want to. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I'm Zach. I'm B. And let's keep staying mortal. See ya. Bye, guys. <laughs>